is Bob Rogers is not uh, Bob Rogers. I get him mixed up. Bob Phillips is not a novice of ministry. And he's been doing this a long, long time. And I'm excited this morning to hear what he has to say. And uh, I think when Pastor called and asked him to fill his pulpit while he was gone, I don't think he could have made a better choice. And we just want, would you all just welcome with me Bob Rogers? Oh, Phillips. I tell you, it is, a, it is a joy to be here and a joy to be a part of this church. Um, I, I, I take it as a great honor, as a matter of fact, just to, uh, to be able to be in this pulpit, to be able to have a time to address you. You know, this, uh, I, you know what, what else I like about this church is things are spontaneous. There's that spontaneity. And, I mean, think about this. You know, here we are singing an Easter song at the end of communion. I would tell you, that's revolutionary in some places, you know. But isn't it great to be a part of what God is saying and what he's doing? And uh, I want to tell you from, from my heart, I, I make sure I don't turn this thing on until I, until I get up there because I don't want anybody to hear me singing. I do love to worship the Lord. I remember at Times Square Church, I accidentally made a mistake. It's the last time I have ever done that. And I turned the mic on too early, and here I was singing and everything. They're taping it. I thought it was the best sermon that I'd ever preached. And uh, the tapes were just going like crazy. I mean, people were just buying it, you know, and, and, uh, and so and I found out why they were buying it. Everybody was saying, hey, Pastor Bob's singing on the per front of the tape. <laughs> and uh, I, they, were, they weren't getting it because of my voice. When I sing in the shower, the shower stops, you know. But, <laughs> but that doesn't stop us from worshiping God. Amen. Well, I do, I do love you, and I, I tell you something that I love about this congregation. Being a pastor as long as I have been a pastor and in the ministry as long as I have, one of the things that I have noticed about you that is such a blessing, and that is the way you treat your pastor and your pastors and, and the pastoral staff and the people here. And I tell you something, there, that's, you just don't know what that does for me just to see. I never stop rejoicing in seeing that kind of thing. And, and you know, the, the kindness that you've shown to me and to my, my wife and, and my children, I just want to thank you, Brownsville, for letting me be a part of you. I, it's a joy. It's a great honor. I want you to turn with me in the Old Testament to Exodus chapter 23. I'm going to read a good portion of these verses because you're talking about something exciting. And you'll see as soon as I begin to read them. These are exciting verses. You're not going to find promises like this just linked together so magnificent, so wonderful, very many places. And there are a lot of great promises in the Bible. But these passages of Scripture are phenomenal. I want you to think about what God is promising you in these verses. I, I'm not sure how many of them I'll read, but Exodus chapter 23, if you'll turn there. I'm going to start with verse 20. Now listen carefully as I read these verses. Think about what God is offering to you as a Christian. Behold, I'm going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Be on your guard before him and obey his voice. Do not be rebellious toward him, for he will not pardon your transgression since my name is in him. But if you truly obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. That's awesome. God says, I'll, I'll, every adversary that comes against you, they'll have to face me. Verse 23, for my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Havites, and the Jebusites, and I will completely destroy them. Awesome promise. He gives a warning. You shall not worship their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their deeds, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their sacred pillars in pieces. But you shall serve the Lord your God. Now look at this. He will bless your bread and your water. That means everything you need. I'm going to bless everything you need for sustenance. Now look at these promises. I get excited about this. I will bless your bread and your water. 
and I will remove sickness from your midst. You know, not only do we need provision, but we need the health to be able to enjoy what God gives us. And so God says, I'm going to, I'm going to bless the provision that you need to live on. Bread and water is more than just food, folks. It's everything we need for sustenance. God says, I will be that big to you. And this is what I'll provide for you. And then he says, I'm going to see to it that you're able to enjoy it. I'm going to remove sickness from your midst. Look at this, verse 26. There shall be no one miscarrying or barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. Now what he says, and, and miscarrying and barren, I believe speaks not only of something physical, but something spiritual, something fruitful. God says that I will see that the length of your days are fulfilled. I'll see to it that you literally fulfill the purpose that I had intended for you on this earth. And I'll make you fruitful, not barren, but fruitful. Now, can you get excited about these promises? I think this is pretty special. That's not all he says. Look at this one. And I will send, verse 27, my terror or my dread or fear ahead of you and throw into confusion all the people among you who come and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. Wow. God says, I'll give you an awesome victory. The verse... 28, he introduces something else into this picture. First of all, his angel. Secondly, hornets. And I will send hornets ahead of you that they may drive out the Hivites and the Canaanites and the Hittites before you. I'll not drive them out before you in a single year that the land may not become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you, but I'll drive them out before you little by little until you become fruitful and take possession of the land. Wow. I get excited about this. I've entitled my message this morning, Angels and Hornets. <laughs> Angels and Hornets. First of all, I want you to understand they were in the land of Canaan. Actually, Canaan, although typified many times as heaven, is not heaven. Canaan is a picture of something that's not heaven. Many of the old hymns speak of Canaan as heaven, Lindell, but it's not heaven. First of all, there'll be no Canaanites in heaven. There'll be no Jerichos to conquer. There'll be no battles that you have to fight. There are no Hivites. There are no Jebusites. There's nothing there. Those things are not there in Canaan. And, and so it's not, it's not a land of heaven we're talking about, but he's talking about a land where there's battles to be fought and a land to be conquered. Now, I believe that Canaan is typical. You know, God uses types and shadows in the Old Testament to teach us about spiritual realities. And I believe that Canaan is typical of two things. <clears throat> Number one, I believe that it's typical of the world. It's struggles, it's battles that are there. You've come out of Egypt, which was a picture of Pharaoh and Satan, and the world in that sense in which you were in bondage, but you came out of bondage, you got saved, led through the wilderness, and now you're at a place where you're about to possess the promises of God the things that he's prepared for you. I believe that that's what Canaan typifies, but I believe it typifies something else. I believe that these battles that he's talking about are not just external, but internal. You hearing me? I believe these inhabitants of the land are not just things that we face on the outside. They're things that God has to remove and we have to battle on the inside. Now, I, I like verse 20. It says, Behold, I'm going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way, to bring you to the place that I have prepared for you. Now, notice that statement, I have prepared for you. Can I tell you something? God has a place called there for you. That's my first point. God has a place called there for you. Now, I don't know where your there is, but he's got a place for you. He's prepared something for you. You are unique to God. You're not like the person sitting next to you. You're not like who you pattern your life after. You may have people that you admire and look up to as great examples, but you're unique to God. We've said this, and I hear Steve say it a lot. Pastor says it. God has a unique plan for your life. But you're not going to fulfill that plan until you get 
there. Now, I, I believe one of the best examples that I could possibly think of would be the story of Elijah. You remember the story in, of Elijah? He's, he's sitting by a brook. And I'm telling you, every morning, breakfast, lunch, dinner, delivered by the ravens. That's a good there. <laughs> I like there, don't you? I like it when things are running so smooth. God's just like clockwork. I mean, he's answering your prayers. They barely come out of your mouth, and there's the answer right before you. I like there. That's a good place to be. But it wasn't long before God had another plan for Elijah. Let me tell you something. God is always taking you somewhere. He's always taking you somewhere. He's never leaving you where you are. Even when we don't seem to understand and feel like God is at work taking us somewhere, He's never passive. Our God is not passive. He's always active. When you don't see Him does not mean that He's not working to take you somewhere. He never rests at that. I don't care how great your conquest was. I don't care how wonderful your victory. I don't care how comfortable your spot. There came a day when Elijah got up and the brook was dried up and no raven came. Now, don't you know that he wondered a little bit about what God was doing? Some of you have been there. Some of you may be there now. I don't know exactly what your circumstances are or where you are, but I want to tell you, I know that I've had many brooks dry up. How many have ever had a brook dry up? And I don't know how long you complained about it or bewailed the whole situation and circumstance, but God was moving you somewhere. Now, I like the story of Elijah because it tells us where God moved him. Now, think about this. Some of you have been here too. He said, Elijah, arise and go to Zarephath. I have commanded a widow to feed you there. Did you hear that? There. And oh, what a surprise. When he got to the place where God was going to take care of him and feed him there, he got to this place and here was a widow gathering some sticks. She had a little bit of bread to make one biscuit. And she had a little bit of oil to mix with it. And she was gathering sticks. And the testimony that she has is, I'm just gathering a few sticks because I'm going to bake this last biscuit for my son and I and we're going to die. <laughs> Now, th that doesn't mean too much until you get into that kind of circumstance when God says, get up from where you are, the comfortable place where you are, and I'm going to take you there. And I'm going to take care of you there. I'm going to feed you there. And you get there, and it's a dead, dried up place, and there's just sticks, and whoever's there going to feed you is about to die. <laughs> How many of you know a little bit of what I'm talking about? But you know what that was for Elijah? It was a special place. It's a place that God had prepared for him. He learned more right there than he learned by the brook. First of all, he learned that God had a special purpose for him. But he had to learn some things. God had to take him to his place of his purpose, and then he had to take him to the place of his power. He had to show Elijah the power of God to produce something from nothing. He had to show the power of God to feed Elijah when there was nothing visible to feed him. No ravens coming, and not only that, but no provision, no food, nothing. Why? Because he had a place called there. That wasn't, the, it wasn't there, it was there. <laughs> See, God had a plan for Elijah that was going to radically affect the whole place. And Elijah, he was going to take him to challenge the Baal prophets at Mount Carmel. He was going to radically change the face of the conditions that were there. And I want to tell you something. God is always taking you there. Always. He's got something he wants to do in you and for you. And although along the way there will be comfortable spots, before long he'll cause that spot to dry up. He'll do whatever he must do to move you there. And I, I believe that this is going to speak to some people here this morning. Now there are some adversaries in the land. And I want to get to those in a moment. But he says something in verse 29. He says, I will drive them out before you in a single year. 
that the land may not become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Let me tell you something. Not only does God have a place called there, but in that place called there, there are adversaries. Now God says, I'm going to deal with your adversaries. I'm going to fight the battle for you. But they had to do something. And I'll tell you, you have to do something. We'll, we'll come to those adversaries in a moment because I believe that they all speak of something. But I, what he says is that I'm not going to do this all of a sudden. Now, don't make a mistake and misread that passage. If there's sin in your life, God is not saying I'm going to eventually get it out. God does not deal with sin by process. It may seem that way. He does it by revelation. Whenever sin is brought to you as a revelation that it's sin, God intends for that inhabitant to be cast out immediately. He doesn't say to you, I'm going to just take my time, a little at a time, I'll take a little here. A lot of people misread that. That's not what that says. But what he is saying, it has nothing to do with defeat. It has everything to do with victory. You know what would happen? <clears throat> First of all, if you took just a few million people and spread them over the degree of, of land that he's talking about here, and what would happen is that there were not enough people to inhabit all of the land that was there. But what he says is this, I'm not going to cause you to possess all the land all at once. And the inhabitants you'll have to drive out a little at a time. You know, I've, I've been overseas some places where it's, it's scarce. In fact, I lived in Wyoming. I didn't even have to go overseas. And I want to tell you, they're, they're, <laughs> they're more deer and antelope. And, and they'll just inhabit. The, the deer will just absolutely. I have sat in front of where we live and counted 70 deer crossing a meadow right in front of the house at one time. I remember my wife, <clears throat> she doesn't like for me to tell this story, but I like to tell it. So can I tell it? I think, I, see, you got me out of trouble. I've got your permission now. One, one day she was in one part of the house and, and she, was, uh, she, just, she just stepped out of the shower and, and the house was where the window was pretty high. I mean, no man could stand there and just look, you know, into the, the shower. And we, we had all kinds of acreage around us, so there wasn't a curtain there, but she just stepped out of the shower. And, and, uh, and I heard this scream. I mean, this just wailing scream from the other part of the house. I thought she'd fall. I thought something happened. I rushed to that part of the house, and when I got there, I said, what's wrong? And she said, there's a mule outside of my window. <laughs> and I, I said, honey, I don't think there are any mules around here. Now, the horses, but I don't think there's any mules. There's a mule outside my window. And what happened, I went outside and I opened the front door and here was this huge uh, moose, cow moose. Now, I'm going to tell you something, don't tell my wife, but they do not look like a mule. <laughs> and what had happened was he just, just having a good time and so he decided he'd come up close to the house and look in the window. <laughs> and he just happened to look in the window at a time when my wife was just getting out of the shower. See, what happens, what happens is this. When, when a land is not filled up, then the wild beasts begin to encroach and take over. Are you hearing me? I mean, they'll go where they don't normally belong. And so what he's saying is that I'm going to work with you progressively, not about sin, but there's some areas, there's some things that have to be removed. And I'm going to do it gradually. I'm going to do it in a process because if I did it all at once, I wouldn't be able to fill you back up. And what I'm interested in is filling you up. I remove something, but I fill you back up with myself so that the inhabitants won't become too numerous for you. Now, God's got this thing worked out. I want to make a statement. And I, I, I can prove this from the Word. <clears throat> but it's God's pattern that God is not foremost interested in what's happening out here as He is what's happening in here. God is not primarily concerned with how bad our circumstances are. I want to tell you something else. He is not, when, when you're going through a trial and Satan is attacking you, his eyes are not on Satan. His eyes are looking to see what kind of response that you've got on the inside. 
See, we don't realize this. God knows that the victory is an easy thing. Sometimes we, you know what, we, we try to sing about it and we talk about it and we do all those things, but down deep inside we don't always believe that the victory's already been won. As a matter of fact, I'm convinced that the church as a whole has spent entirely too much time trying to figure out how to get out of the battle. I mean, we, we have, we have, we have uh, teachings on warfare about how to get out of the battle. We've got, we got praises and we've got all kinds of things about worship, how to get out of the battle. Let me tell you something. Worship, prayer, the Word does not promise to get us out of the battle. It takes us to the battle and through the battle victoriously. I'll tell you something else. I don't believe there's a single outward battle that we ever fight, no matter who causes it, but that God does not have a deeper cleansing work and establishing work that he's intending to do on the inside of us. It doesn't matter what it is. I remember going to a restaurant. How many have ever had an encounter with a gripey, grouchy waitress? Or waiter. <laughs> I remember going to a restaurant one time and it was, I was staying in a hotel and I, and I was really hungry and I went to this restaurant to eat and, and uh, I sat down and, and uh, this waitress came up to me and I could tell we were going to have a good time because she threw the menu down in front of me and she says, what do you want to drink? And um, I said, well, I'll take, uh, I'll take a, a, a Coke and I'll, I wouldn't mind some water in a glass, you know, with lemon. And I'm glad I asked for the glass because she might have brought it to me otherwise. <laughs> but she, uh, she, she brought it to me and she, she set it down. When she set it down, she went like this. And so the water just kind of spilled over on me a little bit. And so I, by this time I, I had given my order. Well, whenever I got my order, it was the wrong order. It wasn't, it wasn't the right order. It wasn't what I ordered. And so I said, you know, this, man, this is not my plate. She says, it is too. I said, uh, no, ma'am, it's really not. It's not, it's not my plate. That is not what I ordered. You know, I, I don't even like this, you know. She says, you haven't tasted it yet. <laughs> this is a true story. I said, well, you're right. I haven't tasted it yet, but I can tell you right now, I don't like it. And I could feel my voice starting to get a little louder. Then I realized I'm a Christian. So I started lowering my voice a little bit. So <clears throat> finally, after uh, an argument with her about whether or not I was going to like what she brought to me or not, she finally said, well, okay, but it's going to take 30, 40 minutes. Well, by that time, I was determined to wait her out. I didn't care how long it took. And so I, I finally got my order, and then, and then I needed some ketchup. And I want to tell you something, I was intimidated by this time by this waitress. I was afraid to ask her, Lyndall, for ketchup. You know, and, and what, every time she walked by me, you know, she'd come by and, and she'd be walking by. And apparently I'd made her mad because I'd be sitting at the table and I'd go. Like this. And, and she, she kept on going. And I'm, I'm, I'm starting to feel something on the inside. And it's not Jesus. And, and before long, I finally got her attention. And, and I asked her for some ketchup. And she just looked at me with those eyes. And she didn't say a word. She just went on. And I forgot how she put down the water. So whenever she came with a bottle of ketchup, she did the same thing. She set it down like that, and ketchup spilled over on my shirt. And she looked at me, and she said, need a towel? And I thought, no, I need a waitress. <laughs> but you know something? It wasn't because of faith and it wasn't because of holiness and it wasn't because of godliness. It was because it seemed like everybody in the restaurant was watching us. And I did not know at that time who had been to the services and who had not.
We were at a conference. If they had still had their name badges on and I could have been assured of that, I would have acted differently. The point is that God sometimes sends an angel to clear the way. Sometimes he sends a hornet. <laughs> now, can I tell you that the role of the angel and the role of the hornet are different? The role of the angel is to lead you and guide you through the land and take you to the inheritance that God has for you. It's to take you to the place called there. The purpose of the angel is to protect you, to guide you, to keep you, to fight the enemy, to fight your adversaries. The mission of the hornet is to get you to move. You know, a hornet, I mean, they're pretty small. They can't really do too much. I mean, a hornet cannot, he's, he's a small little insect. He cannot bodily pick up a Canaanite and throw him out of the land. How many of you ever been outside, nice, nice evening? You're just ready to relax and you've got everything planned. I mean, you're there, you're just, you're just, you're just sitting down and you're just, you're ready. You've got some tea over here and you've got a nice book or you've got something or something you're reading and you're just going to relax or maybe you're outside and, and then all of a sudden, it's not a hornet, but there's a little tiny thing called a mosquito. And, and first of all, you get this little itch on your arm and you start scratching it and you look down and there's a little bump there, a little red bump. Next thing, you get one on the cheek right there, and you're scratching that for a while. The next thing, you get one on the neck, and you're scratching that. But before long, that tiny, that itsy, bitsy mosquito has chased you inside. Now, in keeping with uh, illustrated sermons, which are done here so often, I have, I have brought uh, a hornet's nest full of hornets, and I've got a bat that... If you'll just bring that on out, you know, we're going to lose those hornets in here. And Not really, don't. Some of you are really looking for it. You thought I was really going to do that. God's used my wife as a hornet before. I don't know what you're laughing about. I bet he's used your wife too. Or your husband. God's used my children as hornets before. The point I'm making is that there are things inside us that have to be disturbed before God can get us to the place called there. The place of his purpose and his provision and his power. And he does it because he's got something he wants to do with you. And you become comfortable sitting in one place. And God says, I'm, I'm going to move you. The purpose and the mission of the hornet is to get you off of your course and onto God's course. The purpose of a hornet is to get you to the place. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a place with hornets, but you start, if there's a lot of hornets, I have been. I mean, I have been. Charlie was telling me this story, and the same thing happened to me. My, my brother and I were out walking in the woods one time, and, and there was this hornet's nest and hanging from a tree. And, and he said, look at that empty hornet's nest. I said, how do you know it's empty? And he said, well, I can tell. I said, how can you tell? He says, there are no hornets flying around there. I thought, my brother is stupid. Now, he doesn't mind me saying that. I've called him that face to face. <laughs> he's really not but but sometimes he can do some stupid things but anyway we're arguing about whether it's it's uh, got anything in it or not we're not standing very far from it and uh, and so all of a sudden without even warning me without even asking me my opinion he picked up this rock about that big and threw it he is not even a good thrower but wouldn't you know that today he was right on target? 
He hit that hornet's nest, and I want to tell you, it put a hole in it, and you would not believe how many hornets come flying out of that thing. I want to tell you something. It wasn't empty. We took off running and fighting like this. I mean, there are hornets all around. It got stung several times fighting. We both ended up running and jumping in a creek. Clothes on. Hornets can change your direction real fast. Now, here's my second point. God is always cutting you loose in order to plunge you into the place that he has prepared for you. Always. He's always cutting you loose. If we could just understand some of the things that begin to take place in God's provision and plan for us, we'd begin to react differently against the difficulties that come to us. Now, all of you have got stories of something that's happened and something that's taking place, maybe something right now, where God has had to use a hornet to move you. And sometimes we fight against those things, and we're really fighting against God. I want to make the statement again, I don't care who causes it. God is not so concerned about what the devil's going to do to you. He knows the provision he's made for you. He's not so concerned about what the circumstances are that are ruffling you up. He's not concerned about that. He's not so concerned about what it is that you did to cause the circumstance or the difficulty to be there. What he is concerned about is what's going on on the inside of you, regardless of the source. Now, that's hard. Because angels, angels are fun. I like angels. I don't like hornets. I don't like the mission of the hornets. Sometimes hornets come in a way that they just, uh, it's not always hard and difficult. Sometimes it's kindness. Just the other day we were sitting in the kind of a little, <clears throat> not a living room, but a little in the kitchen we have a little, uh, we got a room, okay? <laughs> I don't know what you call it. <laughs> But, but at any rate, I was sitting there, and, and, and my wife was giving the children some instruction. And my son had some shoes laying out, and she said, Andrew, I told you to pick up those shoes. And I looked over a little bit from Andrew's shoes, and there was a pair of my shoes <laughs> that I'd taken off for about an hour earlier. And then a little bit later, she said to one of the children, she said, where do the dishes go? They do not go in the sink. They go in the dishwasher. And I had just put some dishes up there. So meekly from the other side of the room, I said, uh, uh, some, some, some of those dishes are my dishes. And she looked at me and she said, well, that's all right. She said, you, I forget what she called me, but it was a good word. <laughs> Something like, you're the master of the house. And if you want to put your dishes there, you put your dishes there. But the children, they have to remove those. I want to tell you something. I started feeling the sting. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I mean, I've heard her refer before the fact that she's got three children. Andrew, Nicole, and her husband, Bob. But I, I, I felt the sting. It wasn't because of anything she said to me in an ugly way. It wasn't that at all. She was being very, very kind to me. And I thought, you know something? I've become very lax in taking care of the things that I need to take care of so that it'll put more work on her. Are you hearing me? It was a sting. Sometimes God will use kindness to bring a sting, to remind you of what you need to change and what you need to do. And spiritually, sometimes he'll bless you with something so much in order to remind you of what he wants out of you. And you'd be humbled by it. With the children of Israel, I never understand this, but he says that he sent manna to provide for them every day in order to humble them, in order to show how good he was, in order to show how blessed they were and how much God would take care of us. Sometimes God will so bless us that it humbles us and it stings us. Have you ever been stung by God's goodness? I have many times. At some point, 
At some point, we come to realize that all of us fall into one of three categories. We'll either quitters, campers, or climbers. And it's God's sting of the hornet that lets us know where we are. Some people get stung by the hornet and stung by the hornet and stung by the hornet and they want to give up. Other people have found such a comfortable place to be, they've learned how to endure the sting of the hornet. I, I, re I remember I, I, we lived in Wyoming and so we, I would take my son and occasionally my daughter, but she wasn't into it. My wife wasn't into it at all. So it was usually my son and I, we'd go up into the mountains and, you know, we'd take this tent. And, uh, you know, camping's wonderful. And, and uh, some of you are rugged, rugged outdoorsmen, and you really love that sort of thing. And I enjoyed it. I enjoyed being with my son. If it didn't have the mosquitoes and the ants and the bugs, I'm telling you, that's just not my thing. I mean, I, I, I have to carry a backpack full of bug spray, you know, in order for me to enjoy it. But I, I, I tried to endure it, and I did enjoy it. I did enjoy it to an extent, but I tried to endure it. But, you know, there were the constant things. that there. Sometimes God brings little things. They don't have much of a sting, they're just irritants. And I want to ask you a question this morning. I want to ask you this. What are you going through? Is God allowing the sting of the hornet to touch your life this morning? Is there something right now that you're enduring, something you're going through, something that I want to tell you, if he's stinging you and stinging you and stinging you, if there's something there, it's because God's trying to get you to move. Stop worrying about what Satan's doing. Stop worrying about what your circumstances are. Stop worrying about what your provision is. Stop worrying about those things and say, God, why this sting? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? What's the purpose? What are you trying to do in my life? And I tell you something, I believe this. It doesn't matter what the source. God is at work to bring you to the battle. Now listen to this. We like it when we just barely overcome things. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We, we like it when we're able to just barely overcome things. We, we like it when, when we're able to just kind of get the discomforts out of the way. Can I tell you something? God is not interested in making us comfortable as Christians. He's taking us to the battle. And what he's doing with the sting of the hornet is to get rid of the things on the inside of us that need to be removed in order for him to take us to the place of battle. Now, I, I'm, I know that there's different things here, but he, he talks about some inhabitants. First of all, he says, the Amorite. I'll drive the Amorite out from before you. Now, I've seen different things and, that the Amorite might stand for, and I'm not trying to over-spiritualize it, but one of the things that, that it seems to imply at places is, is speak, to speak or to speech, to say something. You see, the, first of all, there's an outward battle called criticism that God wants you to overcome. The enemy will use constant criticism against you. How I many he'll put you down and he'll talk to you about what you can't do and what you're not. Or he'll use somebody else. And every time you about get your feet up on the solid ground, somebody's coming with criticism. I want you to understand something. If you don't fight through that battle, he'll constantly use it against you. You'll be plagued by criticism all your life. He'll bring somebody. Now, that's not God's hornet. That's a hornet that may be coming from the enemy, but God will use that. And sometimes it happens in a marriage. And I, I'm, I'm not proud of this, but I, I want to tell you something. I didn't realize. I didn't realize for years how much I put my wife down. Now, some of you men need to listen to me. I didn't realize it. I didn't know it. You see, it was a part of me, part of my personality that I didn't realize that, that I, I could be critical. And, and I could be, uh, not a, I could be sweet and critical. But I could be critical. And I didn't realize that in the first part of our marriage, she felt so put down by me, but she never said anything. And if, and if you had told me that I was doing that, I wouldn't even have recognized it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Well, we've worked through that, but I want you to understand something. You can be so put down by somebody, even in your marriage, you can be so critical. And God says, I have to drive the Amorite out of you. Because I've got some place I want to take you. And as long as that stays in you, I can't take you there. 
And then he talks about the Hittite. I wonder sometimes if he didn't choose these, because there are more inhabitants of the land than this. I wonder sometimes if he didn't choose it to make us aware of a lesson or a progression. I don't know if that's true. But the Hittite speaks of fear or terror. Now, fear is a terrible thing. You, you understand that God has to clear out your fears before he can take you to his provision. And friend, no longer, no, no matter how long you try to hold on, it could be fear of the future, fear of rejection. It could be fear of failure. It could be fear of anything. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it might be with you. But until you allow God to sting you with the horn and to get you up, to sting you with the horn, it is not just to move you, it's to bring you into the battle, to bring you into the fight. Instead of seeing these things as just negative and the enemy, maybe God wants us to see it's time I started fighting. Then the parasite. The parasite means an unwalled city. You know, if you allow me to just read into it, I'm not trying to be theologically technical here, but Proverbs 25, 28 says, And he hath, that hath no rule over his own spirits like a city that's broken down without walls. You know, I'm convinced there are a lot of Christians praying for the blessings of God, but their life is totally undisciplined. And I'll tell you, revival perhaps can ruin you like that because you can get to the place where God does so many things suddenly. You hear so many testimonies of how many people he changed in that baptismal pool that you can begin to believe falsely that God is going to deal with you like that, that that's going to be his pattern for your life. And you can begin to think, well, I'm waiting for God to come down and just wow, like that and knock it out. He does do that sometimes, but I want to tell you, those people in that baptismal pool, just like this staff and everybody else, Else has to learn to walk in a disciplined life. It doesn't just happen like that. It doesn't just come like that. He does that at times. But then you have to learn to walk in it. Let me tell you something. I believe the parasite speaks to those of us where busyness rules our lives. Always planning on getting something disciplined, but you never change it. Now, busyness is a, is a fact of life around here, I found out. It comes with revival, busyness, but not all bad busyness. You have to learn how to, you have to learn how to discipline yourself in the midst of the busyness. Are you hearing what I'm saying? What does it do to your prayer life? What does it do to your time in the Word? I, I know, I know that just from being at the school of revival, that there are students that that are there constantly and, and they hear the word and they come to the revival and then, and then they, they, they're in classes and they're hearing this thing all the time about what you ought to be doing and yet their lives, many, many not, not most of them I don't believe, but many have an undisciplined life. We've had graduates of the school saying, you know, I missed out on so much because I didn't get disciplined until the last semester. I didn't get disciplined until the last year. I want to tell you, how much are you missing out upon the place called there that God has for you because you still haven't become disciplined? Then the Canaanites. I believe the Canaanites are a picture of the God of materialism. It really means to press down or humiliate. You know, it's so easy to let things just press you down, isn't it? I remember when we got ready to move, <laughs> when we got ready to move from Wyoming. You know, you know how deceived you can be as to what you have? <laughs> we, we got ready to move from Wyoming, and I said, you know, honey, years ago, years ago, b before we were able to afford anything, I, I, uh, I used to move by U-Haul. You know what I think I'm going to do? I think I'm going to rent the biggest U-Haul truck I can find. And we're just going to drive down there. You drive the cars. We'll get somebody else. And we're just, we're just going to drive down to Pensacola. And we'll see the countryside. You know, we could make it fun. I wasn't thinking about the fact that we had a dog and a cat and children. And... So anyway, I, you know, I, I went out to investigate a U-Haul. And I thought, well, you know, probably the biggest one I could get, one of them won't work. I need to get two U-Hauls. And so I even talked to somebody up there. I said, you know, how, if I pay you to come down, oh, no, I'll do it for free. Well, I'll pay your expenses and just come down. We'll just drive. We'll do two U-Hauls. And finally, my wife and some people on my board of the ministry talked me into getting a, 
a, uh, a moving company. And, I, and, I, and so this truck pulls up, brand new truck, huge truck. I thought, my goodness. I mean, how many people is he going to put into that truck? I mean, this was the biggest U-Haul truck. I'm not U-Haul. This is the biggest moving van truck I've ever seen. And so I remember one up to him. I said, now, how many people are you going to pick up on the way to? Because I wanted to know where my furniture was going to go. And I, how many stops do you have to make? He says, no, this is the only one I've got. I said, well, I mean, I know you don't know feel about half this truck. He said, well, that's all right. Well, I'm going to pick up a load down there. Let me tell you something. The reality was... They closed the door with four of them, one holding stuff, pressing it in like this, and then pushing the doors closed. And I, you wouldn't believe how much stuff we got rid of before then. Most of it junk. <laughs> what I'm saying is that this God of materialism is so easy. I know we stand for it. You know, if, if, if somebody just says to you, you know, don't love the world and don't love materialism. Well, th that's, that's okay. And you say, no, I don't want to love the world. But what happens whenever the pressure and the tension gets so great, what is it when you feel that you need to go out and buy something as an anesthetic? Are you hearing me? That's materialism. That's, that's the way this works. The Canaanite works. See, the hornet sting is so strong that usually we try to find a quick anesthetic. But when it's God's sting, I want to tell you, there hasn't been one made yet. And, and then he talks about some other inhabitant, not only Canaan, the Hivites. And the Hivites, the word Hivite just means a villager, but, but I sort of envision it this way. The Hivite is the one that sort of just enjoys living in the village. Just, there's no walls that are protect, but, but let me tell you what it is. I believe it's the person that likes to be visible, the person that needs approval all the time. Let me tell you something. If you constantly need approval, you are not going to possess what God has for you to possess. You're never going to get there. If you cannot fight and go forward in the battle without being approved all the time, you are limiting God as to where he can take you and what he can do with you. I believe the Hivite stands for those, those times when we just protect ourselves with the artificial. I tell you, there's so many people that keep God out because they're able to go so far and then protect God with the artificial. Did you know you can protect yourselves against God in revival? Did you know that? You can allow him to get so far and not let him get as deep as he wants to get. These are inhabitants of the land that he talks about. Jebusites. Now, the Jebusites speak of depression. It means to trample down. It speaks of that spirit of heaviness. And, and I so appreciate Lindell and what he does because he constantly reminds us of worship as a lifestyle, not singing songs. And it's so easy to get in here. Now, think about this. How many times have you come in depressed, heavy, and you sang the songs and you left revival or you left the worship service. Maybe you jumped. Maybe you clapped your hands. Maybe you got excited. But when you went back out, that spirit of heaviness tried to come right back at you. How many of you know what I'm talking about? It doesn't give up. It's relentless. Now you ask yourself the question, why, God, why? Why don't you get rid of this thing? Well, it's because God's trying to raise up some fight in us. Are you hearing me? I believe one of the difficult things with God taking us where we want to go is there's not enough fight in Christians. And he's trying to raise up some fight in us. I, I remember years ago when I had gone to, uh, I just got, now this was, I was in business at this time. So my brother and I had a habit that I certainly wouldn't do now. We, wa we, we would go every Thursday night, we would go to a drive-in movie just to have time together. And I mean, you know, it really wasn't, I mean, I wasn't even, I wasn't even saved. I thought I was. But God had used a hornet in my business. A, a man who worked for me by the name of David Watkins, he had used a hornet. What had happened was I was going to church regularly, and I thought everything was okay in my life. And, and, and so he went out to visit one of our clients, and that client, was his marriage was falling apart. His, his life was falling apart. He was on drugs when drugs wasn't popular. He was a doctor. 
And, and so he went out, and whenever David Watkins went to visit him, as one of our sales reps, he came back, and the doctor called me and said, if you ever send that man to me again, you'll lose my business. So when David came back, I set him down in front of my desk, and I said, David, I want you to understand something. There's a time for Jesus. I'm a Christian too. There's a time for Jesus and a time for business, and you don't need to be mixing the two. I want you to stop witnessing to him. I thank God for David Watkins. He pulled his chair up as close to my desk as he could get it. He said, Bob, do you know that the man's marriage has fallen apart? I said, yeah, it's terrible. I wish we could do something. He said, do you understand that the man is on drugs? I said, yeah. Yeah, it's a tragedy. He's losing everything if he doesn't stop. He said, you know those things? Have you ever told him about it? I said, no. He leaned over my desk like this, and he said, you're lost. You're not a Christian. I want to tell you, that hornet so stung me. First, I got angry, and I thought, who is he to tell me? I'm his boss. I wanted to fire him, but you know what happened? I ended up canceling all my appointments for two weeks. I went, I went, I was going to, I was going to go on, on, on just, just to drive, just, to, just to drive. And I'd stay at a place and I realized I didn't even have a Bible. I didn't even have a Bible. I had a walled city, but I didn't have a Bible. So I, I got up as early as I could. I got up at eight o'clock and went to this, 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 not a mall, but you know, where there's a lot of shops there. And uh, there was a Bible bookstore there and I went to that bookstore. And I remember this. I'll never forget it. I walked into that bookstore. In fact, I had to wait for an hour and a half because it wasn't open yet. And I sat out there, and I'm weeping and crying like a baby and trying to stop crying enough that I can wipe the tears so my eyes don't look so red when I go in. And then I, I, I finally they, I saw them open the door, turn the lights on, and I went in. I said, I need a Bible. She says, what kind? I said, a Bible. She said, well, what, what translation do you want? I said, I, I don't know. What do you have? And I remember the first one she brought out, some of you that are old enough to remember, was one of these old, the way, no, not the group, the way, but the way Bible had his paperback and had a picture of it, his living Bible. How many remember something like that? Now, some of you are old enough to remember. You didn't raise your hand. But anyway, she brought one of those out. She brought out an Amplified Bible, a King James, a New American Standard. I don't know what else. And she said, which one do you want? I said, I don't know. What's the difference? And she said, she started confusing me, so I just bought all of them. I did. I bought every one of them. I took my stack of Bibles and I got in my car and I drove as far as I could go and I pulled into a hotel and I started praying like I'd never prayed before. I started talking to God and the first thing I said is, God, I don't even know how to pray. Look, I've been five minutes and I'm bored already. I don't know what to say to you, God. But I want to tell you something. That was a hornet. That was a hornet. David Watkins was a hornet in my life. Now, what I started to tell you was, now it was time for the angel. And I was saved now, but I see, I didn't know. I didn't come from this kind of background. I didn't, I didn't know. And, and so it was a Thursday night. My brother and I were at the drive-in, and what we would do, we'd pull up. You know how many, I don't even know if you even have drive-in movies anymore, but they had these humps, you know, and you'd pull up, and we'd pull up the car as close as we could. So we, we'd pull the car so it was like shooting, like ready to shoot off like a rocket, you know. We pulled up just about a few feet from the screen, and, we, and then we'd, we'd put the electric seats back in the car, and it would go all the way back, and then we'd tilt them. I had a brand-new Cadillac Eldorado that I just purchased, and, and so it was back like this, and so here we were laying back like this, looking at the screen. And then we, we, we went and got one of those old filthy hot dogs, you know. We had popcorn hot dogs. That was, it was, that's what we would do, and then we'd just sit and talk, and that's how we spent our time together. We got ready to go, and guess what? Now, what you need to know, and I'm telling this quickly, how God works to lead you. What you need to know is that the next, the next day, David Watkins had invited me to another city to a conference. First conference I would ever attend. And so I was to meet him at a certain time the next day. Now, here it comes. Here's how the enemy will try to handle you. 
So here I am. We're on a Thursday night. I got to leave at 8 o'clock the next morning to be able to reach him where he's going to meet me. And now I'm sitting in this Cadillac, and my, I'm back like this. And, you know, here's the window. My head's about like this. And the electricity, I mean, the electric seats won't work. So when we got ready to go, I'm driving through town. You want to think we got some looks? I'm stretched out. I mean, I thank, I thank the Lord that they had a telescoping steering wheel because I could barely get my hands on it from where I was. And I was laying down like that. We'd pull up to a stoplight and look over. And I'm telling you, we got some weird looks. <clears throat> the next morning I got up and it still wasn't working. I got in that car and I said, well, I, w I went down, I finally took it. They, we were able to take it to the dealership and they did a quick work on it. But by the time I got to where I was to meet David Watkins, he was already gone. I did not know. I knew where the city was, but I did not know where our hotel was. I didn't know where the convention was. I didn't know where to meet him. I didn't know anything. So I started driving. My brother ended up going with me. I started driving, and I got out on the interstate, and I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden, all of the, the power in that car, just, it, it would just stop. It would slow down. I couldn't, it wouldn't go over 30 miles an hour. And then all of a sudden, I'd drive a little bit longer, and it, it, it would shoot up. I mean, all of a sudden, there was power, and I'd be able to go faster. <laughs> and then, and then and all of a sudden, it hit, it hit again, and it went like that. And then before long, it started going like this, like this. And I looked at my brother and I said, do you want to go to this conference? He said, that's up to you. I said, just tell me. If you want to go back, I'll go back. If he had said, let's go back, I probably would have turned back. But I'll tell you, I put up with that. I knew nothing about prayer. I knew nothing about what God was doing. But let me tell you what happened. I got out of the car. Now, I had a, I'm not the same way I was then, so you've got to realize this is a long time ago. I got out of the car and I kicked it as hard as I could kick it. I kicked the front bumper. And I kicked the tires, and I kicked the back bumper. I'm not much of a mechanic. But <clears throat> let me tell you what happened. That didn't make the car run. I stood there watching all those cars go by on the interstate. And I said, you know something? That's it. That's it. I'm going. I'm going to this conference if I have to walk. I'm going. I don't care what this car does. If we take turns pushing it. We're going to the conference. Now, let me tell you something. I got back into the car. Now, listen. I said, there's a hornet that'll come against you, but there's also an angel to guide you. Are you hearing me? I got back into the car, and it ran perfectly. I got to the city. Now, listen. This, it gets better. Listen. I got to the city. I pulled up to the stoplight. I would turn to my brother, and I said, which way do we go? Straight left or right and we would pray cars honking behind us i said that's it we're gonna god's the only one that can get us there we'd be sitting there through two red lights praying it's a true story praying until we got an answer now please understand i did not even know how to pray i don't know about god speaking i don't know about angels i don't know about god leading me i know nothing and I'm sitting there and I'm praying, and he'd say, I mean, we, we turn each other, right. We sit together, right. So we turn right. We come to another stop sign or stop light, straight. We go straight. We made a lot of people mad in that city before the day was over. But let me tell you what happened. All of a sudden, I look over to the right, and coming out of a restaurant, walking to the hotel, is David Watkins. I tell you something, the angel led us in the way. I want to I want to close with this, but I want you to understand what God is wanting for you. We'll give you four things. God is not interested in you just overcoming something. He wants to take you to the battle. You know something? That simplicity of learning to hear God's voice. Before long, I got religious and I lost it. But some of you have done the same thing. Do you understand? I didn't know theology. I didn't know the books of the Bible. 
I just purchased the Bible a few weeks earlier, didn't know how to pray, was frustrated, having nothing to rely upon but God. He literally led us to that convention. And you know something? At that place, my life was radically changed. You understand how simple it is for God to lead us? You understand how little we have to know? We just have to be obedient to Him and reverence Him and honor Him. And God says, I'll be the angel that goes before you. I'll take you through your difficulties. I'll take you through your trials. I'll take you through what I have to take you through. Now listen, here it is. First of all, the reason God sends His hornets is so that His angel can lead you to get you moving. What's God using as a hornet in your life? Is it your husband? Is it your wife? Is it your circumstances? Your job? Your boss? Whatever. He uses different hornets. Number one, he wants you to have a decisive victory. See, God wants to so work in your life so as to break the adversary's power, to break his foothold. Let me read a scripture that I love. Don't turn there, but it's Joshua chapter 11, verse 20. I love this verse. I love this verse. It's a whole different perspective about problems and trials. It was written to Joshua. It was the Lord himself who hardened their hearts to wage war against Israel so that he might destroy them totally. Did you hear that? It was God that hardened the hearts of the enemy so they would attack Israel so that God could be faithful to Israel and destroy them utterly. Glory to God. That puts a different perspective on your troubles. Sometimes God allows you to go through something because he wants to bring you to the place where that thing will no longer have a hold on you, no longer be able to plague you. You don't have to fight the battle over and over and over again. But God says, I'm going to bring a decisive victory. Number two, listen. God wants you to have such a victory that the battle benefits not only our cause, but contributes to the master's cause. See, God is interested in our getting our minds off of our petty battles and even our big battles and understand there's a bigger picture out there. What God is really after, what he's really wanting to do is get our eyes off of what we're fighting through and put them on the bigger battle. He's got some place he's taking you. He's got something he's going to do. It's going to affect somebody else's life. The battle you win may cause the kingdom, somebody watching you to be enhanced and expanded. The third thing, it's not only the victory, but the spoils that God is interested in giving you. The spoils. All over that was a principle. The spoils of warfare. Let me tell you something. I've noticed this, that when I rise up to fight and I begin to battle through something, how many of you notice that once you come victorious with that spirit of fight in you and you begin to be obedient to God and turn to Him, turn it all over to Him, be dependent upon Him, something happens that He gives me more than I expected. He gives me more than I expected. Once I win that battle, there are spoils that I never dreamed of, treasures that He's pulled back and changed. And then fourthly, God is always interested in every battle you have in you gaining new territory. Some Christians live in the same territory they've always been born in. And God says, I want to expand it. Every conquest is to lead you to a battle for a greater conquest. A larger one, a bigger one. A place of greater victory, no matter what it is. I tell you, it changes our perspective when we look through God's eyes on the role of the hornets. And the things that are coming against us and attacking us. Here's what I want to do as I close. I want, you to, I want you to just think for a moment. Those of you that are going through the battle with the hornets, you're being stung. Something's happening in your life, and it's going over and over and over again. Maybe you haven't admitted it before. If there's sin there, in a moment I'm going to ask you to stand that that sin be totally removed. That is not gradual. That's not progressive. That's in a moment of time. That God says, I'll fight that adversary for you. If you surrender, confess it to me. Whatever it might be. See, sometimes the hornets cause some sin to come out. Have you notice that? See, the hornet will cause you to deal with things before you're ready to deal with them. How many of you ever had God sting you enough or something sting you enough, something came out that you didn't want to be exposed? 
something that you were not prepared to deal with at that moment, but God says, it's time. Have a hornet. It's time. He said, no, 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 I'm not ready to deal with it. Yes, it's time. No, I want to just keep this hidden a little bit longer. Okay. I'll expose it in a way you don't want it to be exposed. I'll make it come out in a way you didn't anticipate it. Now, some of you are going through the experience of the hornet. I mean, I feel it. I know you are. And God wants to encourage you, but he also wants to tell you it's time to move on. It's time to deal with that thing. It might be one of those things coming against you, the Hivite, the Jebusite, whatever it is, but it's time to get the land cleared. I want, I want you to just, I'm going to pray this, and then I want you to begin right now. I want you to begin to stand and you say, God, there's something I have surrendered to you. There's a hornet that's come, and I've been fighting this hornet. I've been battling against you, but Lord, I believe, I believe it's you trying to move me on. And, and I'm ready to move on. Would you stand? Would you stand? Something you know specific. I, I'm ready to move on, God. I'm, I'm not willing to stay where I am. And I'm ready to enter into the fight. How many of you are ready to enter into the fight? You're not just saying, God, now take care of this thing. Remove it out. I'm just, comf I'm, I'm just comforted. You're saying, Lord, it doesn't matter. I believe you're in control. I believe you're in charge. I know you, Jesus. I know what you're like. You wouldn't allow anything to come against me that's not there for a purpose. I'm going to get my eyes off the devil, or the eyes off my circumstances, my eyes off myself. I'm going to put it on your hornet because you're using this to dislodge something in me, and I want it dislodged, and I want it gone. Would you tell him that right now? Just tell him, God, I want it dislodged. I want it gone. I don't want to live with it anymore. I want you to expose whatever it is. If I don't know why you're doing it, show me. Holy Spirit, show me what it is. Just lift your hands up to God. And I want you to remember something. Just like I was battling whether to go to that conference or not, and that car was stalling, and when I turned it over to God, things started to run smooth. Are you hearing me? And then, and then God brought the angel. And that's what he's going to do with you. He's going to bring the angel. You may still fight for a while. I'm not saying your battle will end this morning. You may fight for a while, but God says, Now I can take the part of the angel, the mission of the angel. That angel is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not angels. It's the angel. And he says, I'll protect you. I'll guide you. And listen to me. And I'm going to take you to the place called there that I have prepared for you. I want you to just surrender it right now. Just in your own words, call out to God. Call out to God and just make that surrender to Him. I submit to your dealings, Lord. I submit to it, Lord. If there's any sin in your life, there's sin in your life. Maybe that sin's caused by, maybe the hornet's caused something to rise up inside you. You get squeezed on the inside. You know, you squeeze an orange, apple juice doesn't come out. Nor does prune juice. It's it's orange juice. God's squeezing you. There's something coming out that's not pleasant and it's not right. Then you have to say, God, thank you for showing me that in there. I want it out. I want it gone. I want to walk in freedom with you, Lord. Jesus, as we just make the surrender, we ask you to bring the victory. The victory that you promised in Exodus 23 is real for us. Lord, deal with the sin. Deal with the attitudes. Deal with all the inhabitants of the land. Lord, where it be depression, we're going to fight, Lord. And you're going to come with the angel to lead and guide and protect. Lord, if we, if we turn to the world in any way, Father God, whatever it might be, whatever the inhabitant might be, we lay it to you, Jesus, because we want to go on to the inheritance that you have provided and claimed on our behalf. We want to go to the place you've prepared. And we ask you, Lord, let nothing detour us or derail us in Jesus' precious name. Now, I want you just to tell God that you believe that he heard you. And I want you to tell him, Lord, I'll fight with your power and strength, knowing, Lord, your promise that you will deal with my adversaries. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.
Trust in the Lord Trust in the Lord. trust him. We'll look for you back here on Wednesday night for prayer. I know Thursday night for prayer. Wednesday night revival services at the school. Be blessed today. Be blessed today. Trust him.